Now, what you talked about in grade nine, Joseph, what you talked about in grade nine in terms of resistance had to do with what we called and will continue to call, do you remember it? Ohm's, Ohm's law. law. You've seen this before. And really what Ohm's law does, before you can talk about any math or anything like that, you know that if you resist motion, is it going to use up energy? Yeah. yeah. So let's just talk about it in terms of proportionality. If I increase the resistance that something experiences, won't that increase the amount of energy that it, it loses? Yeah. Yeah? So in this case, we're talking about energy per charge, not just pure, pure old energy. So we could say the more resistance that an electron experiences, or a, not, not a resistance per charge or energy per charge, I should say energy per coulomb, the more resistance that a coulomb of charges experience, the more voltage they're going to lose, or the greater their voltage drop will be. Okay? Well, it's going to, the magnitude of the voltage will increase is what I'm trying to say. What about if I talk about water pipes? If I increase the resistance, what's going to happen to the flow rate of water in a pipe? So what if I said, this proportionality is probably true. If I increase the resistance, it's probably true for, for water that the current goes down. And so it's probably true for electricity as well. Yeah? That's, that's a pretty good proportionality. What's that? That would be assuming that electricity. But it does flow in a similar way. There's a flow rate. Okay? So we could say this, you know, with these uh, proportionality statements, we could say, all right, well, that means that resistance is probably somehow proportional to voltage. So if I increase resistance, I'll be increasing the voltage. And if I increase the resistance, well, I'd be decreasing the current. So we say that it's an inverse proportionality. Oopsie, what did I do here? An inverse proportionality. That means one over current. An inverse proportionality. So as as the current increases, that would mean that there's a decreasing resistance. And as it turns out, there's no correction factor here. And this is what Ohm figured out. There's no correction factor. There's no constant. There's none of these, like, uh, you know, a, a fudge factor, if you will. Um, turns out the resistance is plain and simple, just equal to the voltage divided by the current. The electric potential divided by the current. And commonly, the way a, a grade 9 teacher will write it is V equals I times R. Not R equals V over I, but R equals V over I is, is a nice way to talk about it in terms of the real concept behind what's happening. We, re we rearrange it commonly as V equals I times R, probably because people that write equations in textbooks don't so much like to uh, type in fractions. It's easier to write it all in one line, but that's okay. We're not in a type, uh, typewriter era anymore. It's easy to insert equations now. V equals I R is the way it commonly shows up. This is a nice way to talk about what's really going on. Anyway, there are some people in grade nine that got hung up on these stupid things that I hate. Yeah, and if you, if you stunk at rearranging formulas in grade nine, yeah, the triangles, the magic triangles. Here's, here's the issue. Shh. People that can't do math use triangles. But in this course, how many formulas have fit into a triangle? <laughs> yeah, like, like two, <laughs> like maybe three. If, if I see a triangle, it's going to be trouble. This is what I want to see. I want to see you rearranging these guys. If I see a triangle and I just see a magical answer pop out the other end, hey, you're going to lose process marks. Well, good for you. I want to see your algebra skills. Okay, and I, I will applaud you for your success in life. If you go on after this and you use pyramids for the rest of your life and, and maybe you uh, become an Egyptian citizen, that will be wonderful. However, in this course, I want to see your algebra skills as well. That's just a part of what I would like to see. Okay? In any case, V equals IR. Not a big deal. Yeah. What do you think would happen... What do you think would happen? And I'm going to draw a resistor this time. I'm going to forget about light bulbs for a minute. Nice, simple resistor. I'm going to draw an ammeter in this circuit as well. 
I'd even like to be able to measure the voltage, the electric potential difference across this resistor. So we're going to do a thought, ex pardon me, a thought experiment. And we'll do the real experiments afterwards, OK? But here's the thought experiment. Based on these proportionalities, if I have a power supply, and I'm able to, to change this power supply. People actually uh, talk about having uh, dimmer switches and that sort of thing. But let's say that I'm able to change this power supply. And there, there's another, another symbol that's frequently used. I'll talk about having um, some sort of a, a dimmer switch symbol. But I don't want to introduce new symbols too much. Let's just say that we're able to increase the voltage on this power supply. That's a symbol for a rheostat. A rheostat, yeah. If I increase the voltage on this power supply, what's going to happen? to the current. Let's say that this is the voltage axis. What happens to the current? <coughs> it increases. So if I have voltage and current, so that if I increase the current, uh, increase the voltage, I increase the current, then you might get a graph that looks something like this. That would be one way of talking about it. Another way of talking about it would be the other way around, where if I increase the voltage, the current will increase like this. Do both of those graphs make sense? Yeah. Here's where we come into which graph would uh, be meaningful in terms of our math. If I have this graph here versus this graph here, if I find the slope of the first graph, let's just choose two points. We don't have to do the calculations. But if I choose do the slope of the first graph, that would be I, V, or change in I over change in V. And I would say I over V is the slope. No problem. If I do the slope of the second graph, I've got V and I. And the slope would be V over I. Which of these two slopes? looks familiar to you. V over I. This one here. And where it looks familiar is back up here. As it turns out, if I plot a graph where I gradually increase the voltage, you will get an increase in current. And if you, I can gradually increase the voltage and thereby get a gradual increase in current, and I record those values, you know, V, I, in some sort of a table of values, I could plot them on a graph. So V is on the vertical axis, current is on the horizontal axis. And if I find the slope for that circuit, as I increase the voltage, I will measure increasing currents. What will I be able to tell? Yeah? Uh, like you get more resistance yeah. Well, how would I find the resistance? By like measuring the voltage. Like measuring the voltage, measuring the current, and doing what calculation on the plotted data? The slope, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I find the slope of this VI graph, I can find the resistance. Now I could also just find the, the voltage at one particular time and the current at one particular time. But one of the powerful things about actually doing the graph is that for some resistors, the graph isn't perfectly linear. For some resistors. For a perfect resistor, what we would call a perfect ohmic resistor, the graph is perfectly linear. So you could just simply do for any individual voltage measure measurement and for the matching current measurement for a given voltage for a battery, you could take the V value and the I value. You get the R value and feel fairly confident that that resistance that you've calculated is the resistance, the average resistance for that resistor. For a non-ohmic resistor, the resistance maybe varies depending on how much voltage is being placed across it. We're going to assume in this course that they're all ohmic resistors. So yeah, you could approach it by the graphic method. Or you could approach it by the, the simple equation method. And you should get roughly the same result if it's an ohmic resistor, or, you know, what we'll consider to be a perfect resistor. What's an example of a not perfect resistor? In, in, in other words, maybe you talked about this in grade 9. What's an example of a resistor whose resistance changes as it heats up? Do you know about this? Yeah, it turns, it turns out an incandescent light bulb is in this category. It turns out that if you have an electric stove, the elements in your stove may be in this category. There's a number of things that do fall into this category. Uh, people talk about something called a thermocouple. And a thermocouple is one where the resistance changes as the temperature changes. And you can actually 
run a current through a thermocouple, and based on the resistance that that current encounters, based on voltage measurements and current measurements, you can plot a graph that will actually tell you what temperature it must be based on the resistance of the thermocouple. That's a fairly useful thing. So ohmic resistors have their place. Non-ohmic resistors have their place. But we're going to focus more on the ohmic ones, the ones that follow this nice, simple rule. Okay? 